My name is Andrew Feldman. I'm a program manager with Microsoft on the Azure Cosmos DB team. Today, I'm going to introduce you to Azure Cosmos DB, what it is and why it's popular, and I'm going to introduce tools and techniques that are important for you to have a successful deployment. Along the way, we will learn what special capabilities differentiate Azure Cosmos DB from on-premise databases or other cloud databases, how to go big and take your deployment to full scale to meet demand, and how to monitor, debug, and secure your deployment. To start, what is Azure Cosmos DB? We are a fully managed, globally distributed database service. Our product can store and retrieve documents around the globe at the exceptional scale and latency required for modern web applications. Cosmos DB also happens to be a non-relational database or NoSQL database. A non-relational database stores and accesses data using a key to identify some value which may be as simple as a single integer or as complex as a highly nested JSON document. It's great to leverage non-relational database when you have a high volume of data to store and you want to scale out the database in the cloud to serve that data. By scale out, I mean to share the workload of storing and serving data over many servers, using the cloud to elastically provision the necessary hardware. There are a few reasons why NoSQL is taking off now as a database model, the most important being the flexible data requirements. Relational databases are about normalization and data integrity. You fix the database schema before coding because schema changes are time and resource intensive. Then by comparison, there's non-relational or NoSQL database. Non-relational takes away constraints, giving your application the flexibility to customize the data on the fly. The application may choose to keep a rigid, normalized database structure, or else choose to denormalize some or all data in order to make read operations more efficient. Embedding one JSON document within another, putting unlike entities together in a container, and wholesale copying documents from one collection to another are all denormalizations allowed within non-relational database that increase data locality and thereby reduce the number of read operations for typical user actions. But these denormalization techniques would be forbidden on a relational database platform, and that's the key difference. These techniques may seem alien, especially if you are coming from a relational database background, but these techniques help increase scalability and performance for some applications. So why choose Cosmos DB? Well, here are some examples of some of the benefits you'll see. One is lower cost of ownership. That's a big one. That's something a lot of our customers really appreciate. Uh, we've seen a lot of customers initially using on-premise non-relational database, but then switching to Azure Cosmos DB because they can avoid server management, reduce licensing cost, and just have someone else do all of the difficult management work because at the end of the day, Cosmos DB is a platform as a service. And when we do that management work, you get to focus on your business priorities. Second, Cosmos DB enables dynamic scaling based on traffic patterns. The service supports fast performance for high volumes of transactions, and in addition to manually provisioned throughput, also supports auto-scaling of throughput to your level of utilization. Finally, Cosmos DB supports a guaranteed performance SLA, multi-master reads and writes, global replication, and now with Synapse Link and Synapse Analytical Store, we have a zero ETL capability for processing and converting OLTP operational data into the OLAP analytical store. These are all benefits which customers greatly appreciate with Cosmos DB. Now in terms of how Cosmos DB is getting used in industry, the common trend is that we work a lot with these five verticals, retail and hospitality, uh, manufacturing, financial services, healthcare and life sciences, and media and communications. So for example, e-commerce, uh, in that area, we're often supporting services which take the form of shopping carts, mobile applications, and member loyalty programs. Or in manufacturing, our use cases might look like Internet of Things or IoT solutions, uh, predictive maintenance, field service monitoring, and logistics. And the list goes on for the other verticals. There are many examples of customers who have accomplished their goals using Azure Cosmos DB. I'll start with Symantec. Uh, since the split off, uh, they've be, since become Norton LifeLock. Uh, but at the time, their goal was to optimize their infrastructure to be cloud native. Because in their use case, they needed to forecast cybersecurity events. And initially, they were using an on-premise non-relational database as part of this system, but it was not meeting their needs. Consequently, Symantec migrated their virus and malware tracking system to Cosmos DB in the cloud. 
And for Symantec, Cosmos DB enabled fast turnaround on threat detection to detect and block traffic. In a scenario where fast pass-fail classification on whether a machine should be locked down was required, database performance, cost, and scalability mattered. And the 40% savings shown here on the database includes both licensing and capacity. And with the American Cancer Society, their use case revolved around DevOps for mobile app development. Uh, their app was for collecting donations. American Cancer Society faced many challenges before going cloud native. Essentially, it was very hard to streamline collaboration and development, and there was no way to efficiently push software updates to members. So this led to their goal, which was to streamline the entire donation experience so that consumers can benefit cancer research. And their method was to streamline their DevOps environment and standardize on Azure DevOps and Azure Cosmos DB. Ultimately, this choice enabled fast release cycles on their mobile app, resulting in a year over incre year increase in 55% in their revenue. And then ASOS, so with the help of Azure Cosmos DB, ASOS doubled their sales during Black Friday. ASOS was another case where the customer had an on-premise installation which couldn't handle model, modern development processes such as software patching, maintenance, etc. But after migrating their processes to Azure, they used Azure Cosmos DB to develop an automated recommendation system using Azure Cosmos DB Graph API, which helped them to increase sales. Now there's a few more customers I want to mention. So Exxon, Exxon standardized on Dynamics 365, Azure Cosmos DB, and many other Azure data services. Exxon's use case is for well assets. If you were to make an analogy to a telecom provider, well assets would be like field assets, such as the home CPE equipment or a mobile phone. However, the challenge compared to an area like telecom uh, is that well assets are distributed over various regions. As an example, say I go to a well in Houston and the well is not outfitted with IoT sensors, not outfitted with monitoring. I have to take a note manually on a notepad of the state of each piece of equipment and drive from well to well, asset to asset, which is time consuming. And then later I have to type that all in. By using Azure IoT in conjunction with Azure Data Services, the IoT sensor can send me status updates and indicate any concerns, thereby cutting out all of that manual effort. When I go out to work, I can actually see where I need to go in the morning based on warnings or predictive maintenance indicators. Additionally, with Dynamics 365, there's the concept of dispatch mode, where as a dispatcher, if there's an issue, I can reroute that technician based on the view of the signals I'm getting from IoT and the priorities from my perspective. And we can surface that info into other CRM systems, such as, for example, Salesforce. Finally, another customer I want to talk about is Walmart. Walmart relies on Azure Cosmos DB for a number of high value services. What I want to touch on here is Walmart's e-commerce catalog. Walmart builds an e-commerce catalog out of the data and data sets provided by sellers, suppliers, and brands. However, when Walmart obtains these first and third party data sets, they would like to extract additional information from the metadata, specifically the title, description, and images that tag along with the data itself. Thanks to Azure Cosmos DB, Walmart was able to realize this idea as Walmart Retail Knowledge Graph. Walmart originally tried other on-premise database solutions before settling on Azure Cosmos DB for its Gremlin Graph API. After building a Hadoop data processing pipeline and extracting the desired graph relationships between entities, Walmart could then persist that information to Cosmos using bulk ingestion APIs. With Walmart Retail Knowledge Graph, Walmart will have the ability to better understand product-customer relationships and help customers find products they might not have known about otherwise, increasing customer satisfaction and sales. Okay, so Cosmos DB is designed with the idea in mind that your application should be able to store as much data and handle as much traffic as you need without being limited by the service. That's why you pay to scale out the service as much as you need to in order for your application to function, and we don't create an upper limit. Elastic scaling is one of the most important features of the service. We provide the capability to scale throughput up and down and to go from 10 to hundreds of millions of requests per second and we provide a very flexible pricing model that we think makes this affordable. With Cosmos, scale up and scale down is always entirely managed on our end. There's no monitoring servers or managing hardware. You just enter a scale and you press a button. Thanks to Azure's world-class infrastructure, Cosmos comes back by competitive SLAs on latency, availability, and that's five nines of availability uh, in that SLA, as well as throughput and consistency. 
Next, I want to explain what I really mean by scale out. Scale up means buying a more powerful machine. But in a scale out model, we keep the same size server SKU with compute and SSD back storage, and we simply duplicate that SKU when more throughput or storage is required. The identical SKU nodes that share the responsibility of handling requests are called partitions in our parlance. But if you have used other distributed NoSQL databases, you might know the term shard or sharding. So you can mentally substitute that in for partition or partitioning. So basically the partitions slice up the stored data into shards and each partition is responsible for handling only its own subset of the data. Cosmos slices up the data and assigns responsibility to physical partitions using a very specific process in which one field of the document, called the partition key, is hashed when the document is inserted, and in advance each partition is assigned a subset of the range of possible hash values. And in that way, a partition is assigned responsibility for some non-contiguous set of partition key values corresponding to that continuous range of partition key hashes. Cosmos maintains high ability in part through four-way replication of each partition in a leader follower arrangement. So when a partition is assigned all documents within a range of partition key hash values, really that subset of the data is being duplicated four times on separate SSD storage and with a separate CPU for serving requests so that any one of those followers could take the leader's place in the event of a failure. And this is true of every partition making up a container in Azure Cosmos DB. So getting back to what scale out is, you can request more throughput or you can store more data, and Cosmos detects when it needs to scale out further to store and serve this data. This process starts with Cosmos automatically provisioning another machine. Then the over full partition will move half its documents to the new machine, assigning the new machine half of its hash key range in the process. And this will result in the creation of a new partition that stores and serves data. As I said, with Cosmos, there's no effort on your part to monitor servers or orchestrate scaling out machines. I'm going to walk you through a case study that demonstrates scaling out a Cosmos deployment, and you'll see how simple it is. In this fictional example, a customer has ingested 16 terabytes of airline telemetry as JSON documents into Cosmos. To simulate this, I have a synthetic data generator written in C-sharp that is ingesting documents in bulk to simulate telemetry data. Now, Cosmos DB is scaled out to hundreds of machines to store and serve this data right now. But this isn't big enough though. For my use case, I wanna go even bigger and scale up the throughput by some amount. Here, the exact amount of the scale up is not important. The point is to understand Cosmos scalability and the process for increasing scale. The dashboard view that I've been showing you belongs to the Azure portal, which is where we manage Azure resources such as Cosmos DB. Let's look at scaling out in the portal, although as we will discuss later, it is possible to do so programmatically through our SDKs. First, navigate to Data Explorer, find the database and container. Drop down and find the Scale and Settings section, and the first thing you see is this text box. This text box is your single scale knob for Azure Cosmos DB. We want to go bigger, so we type in the new value of throughput that we want, and hit Save. That's it, folks. How to scale out Azure Cosmos DB in one step. Now you might be wondering, what does this provision throughput number that I ramp up or down to rescale the database actually mean? What are its units? Request units, or RU, are how we compress Azure Cosmos DB cost and scale into a single number. Internally, Azure Cosmos DB comprises numerous infrastructure components, which each have some capacity cost associated plus some operating expense per request. But Azure Cosmos DB is what we call platform as a service. And that means we hide all of those costs. To the user, our backend assigns each request a processing cost in abstract request units based on estimating capacity and operating expenses. Then each container has a provision throughput field, allowing the user to specify a ceiling on request units per second. So when you specify throughput in RU per second, Effectively, you're provisioning a quantity of database compute per second to be available for handling requests. Now this provision throughput is what Azure Cosmos DB looks at along with data volume to determine how many backend machines your container requires to store and serve data. Think about it this way. With Azure Cosmos DB, you don't think about scaling out each component. You don't have to worry about the number of machines, network bandwidth, SSD size, number of cores, or anything else like that, leaving you free to focus on your business. Now returning to the Azure portal, you see here we have a choice between auto scale and manual throughput. 
Well, the best choice depends on the use case, so let's look at the best practice. When throughput is basically consistent, no up or down trending, it's enough to manually provision the throughput on the container one time. Just set and forget. If you choose the proper number of RU per second of throughput, you will not be over or under paying. If the workload throughput varies dramatically over time, though, then this might not work so well. You'll have to pay for the highest throughput you might use. But what about when the throughput goes down? You shouldn't have to pay for that. This is an opportunity to programmatically provision throughput. Our SDKs allow any client with the proper permissions to do this, where the client can programmatically, uh, at the proper time, lower the throughput or increase the throughput so that you're only paying for what you expect to consume in a given time window. This is a great way if you can anticipate traffic changes due to holidays or day-night cycles and you want to reset the throughput accordingly. Now, if you can't predict throughput changes, that is where autoscale is best. There's no more need to anticipate because the service tracks hourly peak consumption and bills only for that. Customers love that Azure Cosmos DB Autoscale tracks your usage and adjusts provision throughput. And by design, there's no latency or overshoot in the process. There is potential for immense savings using this feature. When we introduce Azure Cosmos DB, we never introduce it without mentioning that it's globally distributed. And that's because global distribution is critical to our SLAs and promised service. We offer a sub 10 millisecond P99 latency SLA. With speed of light delays, this is only possible at a global scale if you have the kind of global data center network that Azure has in order to guarantee that we are where your users are. With turnkey global distribution, you can put your data where your users are in minutes. That's because as part of Cosmos DB being a managed service, Cosmos automatically replicates all your data around the world and across more regions than AWS and Google Cloud Platform combined. We offer a convenient interface through our portal or our SDKs for configuration of your replication regions as well as uh, manual and automatic failover processes and automatic and synchronous multi-region replication to help your application go global. Now, Azure Cosmos DB offers five well-defined consistency models so that you can choose the best one for your app. The five well-defined cons well consistency models run the extreme from eventual to strong. For example, bounded staleness gives you essentially strong consistency, um, but with uh, essentially a time or uh, operation count bound uh, specifying how lax is the strong consistency requirement. Session consistency allows a read my writes uh, ability where anyone with the session token will be able to read the rights of others with the session token and consistent prefix is essentially eventual consistency but with a guarantee that uh, ordering will be preserved uh, nonetheless now let's modify the airline telemetry account consistency setting to ensure telemetry from one region always arrives in order in another region Navigate to the default consistency blade and select consistent pre prefix from the list of consistency models along the top of the page. Uh, this will guarantee the ordering. The portal shows a musical note animation which explains the meaning of each consistency model. Click Save to apply this setting. Our account exists in West US 2 and East US. Perhaps I also want to configure failover behavior as well. Navigate to the Replicate Data Globally blade. This is the portal UI for configuring turnkey global distribution and all of the Azure Public Cloud regions are shown on the map. If I click one or more regions, they will appear on the list of read regions from my count in the order selected. In this way, I can specify the order in which Azure Cosmos DB will fail over to different regions. Again, none of this takes effect until you click Save. Using this UI, you can also make other changes, such as configuring single or multi-master for the account. In the next section, we will discuss monitoring, debugging, and security. But while we are here, I want to point out some great tools that are built right into Cosmos. A great feature of Azure Cosmos DB Portal is the collection of built-in metrics on service performance. If you're debugging an issue with your application, these provided metrics can be a great starting point to rule out database issues. Looking as we are at the metrics blade of the Azure Cosmos DB Portal gives us at-a-glance request statistics. The central plot, number of requests aggregated over one minute interval, is useful for determining whether a specific error or errors suddenly spiked in frequency after you implemented an application change. 
The reason is that Azure Cosmos DB SQL API empo employs HTTP status codes as its primary indication of success or failure mode when it sends a response back to the SDK. The legend in this plot is a list of the HTTP 200 and 400 series errors you may encounter, with HTTP status code 200 indicating success and all others indicating some specific failure mode. In fact, take a look at the plot. When I turned on the synthetic airline telemetry generator, the blue curve, corresponding to status code 200, success, spiked as requests poured in and were processed successfully. However, the green curve also spiked. Now look at the legend. The green curve corresponds to status code 429. Status code 429, or error code 429, is a sign that my client application is driving more RU per second of throughput than I have provisioned my container to handle, and excess requests are being rejected. This state is called throttling, and it is critical to understand that Azure Cosmos DB does this. It is not a limitation, rather, it is a capability that is usually lacking if you use an on-premise database or a database you have installed on cloud VMs which you manage yourself. The reason is that most databases won't restrain traffic from your application. Naturally, as the designer, you want to drive as much throughput to your database as possible, and in turn, the database will try to provide, driving up its response time under the load. You can basically drive traffic until the database breaks, i.e. the response time becomes basically unusable. And in fact, this is a common mode for benchmarking. This approach is great for max throughput, but it's not so great if you want to max out throughput but also keep latency low. And Azure Cosmos DB uses a different model, built to allow exactly the throughput you paid for it to be delivered while guaranteeing latency SLAs. Built-in resource governance mechanisms will immediately throttle any traffic beyond provision throughput, ensuring your latency stays low. And this is important because when Azure Cosmos DB starts returning error 429 throttling, your instinct might be that you just need to push harder and drive more throughput from the client, but that is actually what not to do. When you see throttling, it is often a sign that something in your app architecture is not configured correctly. So your first step should be to check for common issues around partitioning, strategy, and data modeling. Those two pillars need to be optimal in order to get the throughput you expect. There are some other factors too, which we will discuss later. If you see no issues, then and only then do you either scale back throughput from your client or provision more throughput on the service side. Returning to the metrics blade of the portal, navigate the, to the storage section and you find a breakdown of how data is distributed in the container. The bottom bar chart, data plus index storage consumed per partition key range, displays the top 20 to 30 Cosmos DB partitions in this container, ranked by gigabytes of data stored on SSD. Notice even at the high end of the distribution, data is basically spread evenly. Even distribution of stored data and throughput among partitions, manifesting as a flat or smooth bar chart such as this one, is a central pillar of good partitioning strategy for Azure Cosmos DB. It's all about choosing the right partition key. The opposite situation, some partitions being highly overutilized compared to others, is what happens with poor partition key selection that does not spread traffic evenly. When the partitioning strategy concentrates traffic on one partition, we call that a hot partition. Naturally, in an uneven scenario, some partitions happen to get less traffic, and then we call that a cold partition. Although Azure Cosmos DB is always capable of providing the throughput you've provisioned, being throttled while you're still below provision throughput is a common symptom of poor partition strategy and hot or cold partitions, because one partition is approaching the RU per second ceiling, while the others are effectively underutilized. Partitioning strategy is costly to change later on, and it's something you want to do your best to get right from the start. Another great set of debugging tools built right into Azure Cosmos DB are query metrics and request diagnostics. These tools provide per request metrics on service side performance of Azure Cosmos DB. The easiest way to see query metrics is to run a query in the Azure Cosmos DB portal. This is easy. Just navigate to the airline telemetry container in Data Explorer. Find and click the new query button and the default select star from C query should appear. We just want to see an example of query metrics and we don't care about the query itself. So just hit run and wait for this to complete. Once the list of query results appears, then you will notice a query stats option just above the results list. Quick click query stats. If the appropriate option is enabled in the request header, Azure Cosmos DB returns query metrics shown here, which include request charge, received document count, and document load time. The large request charge is actually expected. Select star from C will try to return the entire database. 
and we're, we're just showing it here as an example query. These metrics are very useful when debugging issues with query cost or performance. Really though, most customers want to automatically collect these metrics on the client side, not in the portal. So, here's an example of running a Java Cosmos DB client application which sends a request and prints out request diagnostics. Request Diagnostics is a structure in our Azure Cosmos DB SDKs which encapsulates many performance metrics, including query metrics. At the top of the program, we define a SQL query string, and later in the program, we execute that query string against the service. Inside the execute query function, we get a query response object from the SDK, that's the page flux response, and that is what we can use to obtain and print out the query metrics. Run the code, and we can see request diagnostics streaming into the terminal after the query ex executes against the service. Examining the output, we can see many of the same useful pieces of information as we saw in the portal. Measures of request charge, request execution time, and breakdown of the execution time into components. The request diagnostics to string is pretty nice. It even generates tables showing a timeline of what the backend service was doing to process the query. If you run a query and it, say, it is, say, 10x slower than expected, then this timeline in request diagnostics will be incredibly useful information for debugging that runtime. I also want to show an example of client-side query profiling in this project. Deeper in the log file, you can see that actually I instrumented this project with a simple profiler to clock total query execution time. Instrumenting your code for client-side query profiling like this is strongly recommended as a debugging tool especially in conjunction with request diagnostics, for a simple reason. In large cloud deployments, issues with throughput, latency, and cost show up in end-to-end -end measurements. Even just in Cosmos DB, we don't know whether a slow query is due to the client, the network, or the service side. Combined client-side qu query profiling with SDK request diagnostics allows you to affirm that between the service and client, one or the other is causing your problem. In fact, if we take a look, notice one thing. For a 16 terabyte dataset, this query was actually pretty fast, less than a second. How is that possible? Well, take a look back at the SQL query string. By my choice of query, I've made it very clear that this query filters on where partition key equals some value. This is the most efficient way to query in Azure Cosmos DB, by making your query filter on a partition key equality. The service has the intelligence to route this query directly to the proper partition. So if we index property properly, the query cost doesn't scale with dataset size. Now, the, the opposite is also true. There are high fanout queries which do not filter on partition key, meaning the query searches or fans out to all partitions to find a handful of documents. These queries will become slower and more costly as the database scales out. Imagine sending 10,000 high fanout queries to your container versus sending 10,000 queries filtering on partition key every second. The former will hit each partition with 10,000 queries per second. But the latter queries will all get routed directly to their target partitions and will therefore be distributed among the partitions, assuming an equal distribution of traffic. So clearly, the queries filtering on partition key are more efficient and they're going to cost you less. So it's definitely the way you want to go. To close out this section, I'll provide you with some final tips on optimizing Azure Cosmos DB for performance and cost at scale. First, make sure that your client application configures the correct geographic region using the SDK. Configuring your application to interact with the geographically nearest region can make an order of magnitude difference in your observed latency. You configure this using the application region setting in the Azure Cosmos DB SDK. Also, remember that tests run on a personal machine or dev machine are not guaranteed to be performant. Only carry out performance sensitive runs on Azure. Second, Optimize index settings for your application. This is a great way to save on cost or RUs. If you query on a particular JSON field more than infrequently, make sure that field is indexed on the service side. This avoids scanning the entire partition just to find a handful of documents. Third, query on partition key whenever possible. If your query contains a clause requiring a certain partition key value, this tells Azure Cosmos DB which machine or partition your data is on. Azure Cosmos DB has the built-in intelligence to route your request directly, provided that you do this. But if you don't make these kinds of queries, then a full scan of all of the partitions will be performed. Each partition that has to be checked when executing a query incurs some RU charge, even if no results are found. Imagine the cost of querying our airline telemetry data set with hundreds of partitions, just because our query did not filter on partition key. Fourth and finally, spend the time to choose a good partitioning strategy. For write-heavy workloads, it is critical 
that you pick a partition key with high cardinality, i.e. larger number of possible values. This helps avoid hot partitions on writes. For example, a massive GUID field, like the one shown here, has more possible values in a single digit number or a name field, and is therefore better as a partition key for write heavy workloads. For any workload, try to choose a partition key that evenly distributes data among partition key values. Again, this helps avoid hot partitions and ensure that you can fully utilize your provision throughput. Although it may seem similar to an index, remember that partition key is not an index and you cannot change it later with the click of a button. So do your best to choose a good partition key early on. All right, in this section, I'm going to dig deeper on debugging and production monitoring techniques with Azure Cosmos DB. The best tools for this at our disposal are client-side profiling for end-to-end -end perf performance measurement, Cosmos DB request diagnostics for debugging individual request performance on the service side, and Azure Monitor. We actually already looked at the first two in the previous section when I showed a Java sample application that printed the request diagnostics and profiled the overall query execution time. So the focus of this section will really be on what you can do with Azure Monitor. Azure Monitor is a suite of tools for aggregating, visualizing, and querying statistics about the service performance. And even there, I'm going to drill down to focus primarily on one feature of Azure Monitor, Azure Log Analytics, and show you some examples of live site monitoring and debugging that you can do using log data queries. First, a quick overview of Azure Monitor. Azure Monitor is actually a distinct service from Azure Cosmos DB. From a developer perspective, it hooks into most Azure services using some built-in monitoring support added by the service developers, pulling in raw data on service activity and performance. From a user perspective, Azure Monitor gives you a suite of tools to detect and diagnose signs of trouble in the collected data and to visualize the service data, so you can see trends or issues at a glance. Comparing these visualizations to what you saw on Azure Cosmos DB portal metrics, the biggest difference is first, that Azure, Azure Monitor lets you correlate information across multiple services and multiple layers, such as infrastructure, platforms, and applications, uh, so that you're not just looking at data about Azure Cosmos DB. And second, Azure Monitor provides more options for visualization alerts and customization of what you do with the service data compared to the Azure Cosmos DB portal metrics. Azure Monitor even allows defining custom sources to incorporate into your data collection. And as this diagram shows, Azure Monitor is made up of five categories of tools for processing and reacting to service data. Under the tools labeled Analyze, there is Log Analytics. Log Analytics is a very powerful log-based debugging and monitoring tool, which we see in practice is widely used by our customers to detect or root cause live site issues. So next, I'm going to talk about some Azure Cosmos DB use cases for Log Analytics with examples. So, what is Azure Log Analytics in more detail? When you enable Log Analytics, then it is always running in the background in the cloud alongside Azure Cosmos DB, logging every request to the service. The designers of the Azure Cosmos DB integration for Log Analytics built the pipelines to provide rich metadata on each logged request while scrubbing any sensitive information. With Log Analytics, you can write complex queries over this rich log to understand and visualize users' historical activity, and learn about you know, their operation types they're doing, regional origins and destinations of their requests, uh, size of their requests, and more. And this turns out to be an excellent tool for uh, monitoring and debug in large deployments where trouble usually manifests end-to-end -end as a de deficit in some performance, and you're gonna spend a lot of time and effort to pinpoint an individual service as the bottleneck. Having detailed logs and the ability to query them makes this a lot less tedious. Azure Log Analytics for Cosmos DB consists of a single table, Azure Diagnostics, in which each row is a request and each column is information about that request in some way. There's a column named Category which can have five different values shown here corresponding to different metadata about the same set of requests. There's Partition Key Statistics, Partition Key RU Consumption, Query Runtime Statistics, Data Plane Requests, and Control Plane Requests. The table pivots on the Category column in the sense that depending on what the value of category is, different columns are populated with the values. So for example, when category is partition key statistics, then columns related to partition key statistics are populated in that row. And when category is query runtime statistics, then only the columns needed to describe query runtime are populated. For the partition key RU consumption and data plane request categories, a column with the request type will be populated, and you can leverage that in your queries to understand the behavior specifically with respect to certain request types. 
So now I will jump into some live site and monitoring debug examples. The goal is to find clues to common application issues and examine patterns in user database access. So one way to use Azure Log Analytics is to write a query on recent requests summarized by partition, counting the average request units per second for each partition. This gives you a snapshot of hot and cold partitions as well as the amount of partition skew or imbalance. It's great to monitor hot partitions and partition skew proactively as they signal potential scaling issues down the road. If you have issues with throttling or fully utilizing your provision throughput, hot partitions are a good thing to check for. In website use cases such as retail, latency is often a critical parameter which makes it valuable to monitor and debug. For this scenario, you can imagine an Azure VM accessing a Cosmos DB container from the same geographic region. Often, users are more interested in debugging the worst case latency, so let's focus on how you can monitor and debug P99 latency in this arrangement. Well, Azure Diagnostics includes a duration or latency value for each request. With Log Analytics, we can easily bin requests by minute and calculate the 99th percentile for each bin, and then generate this time chart visualization. This is great for identifying latency spikes, and with the time chart visualization, you can correlate the spike time with other events happening in your system. What if you have a latency problem, but it only happened during a specific period of time and only in a specific geographic region? You want a visualization that doesn't mix in data from other regions. Furthermore, you suspect the problem is really with a single Azure Cosmos DB partition. Another good query you can run is to first summarize the data by timestamp, partition, and geographic region, and then bin the timestamp by the minute and plot a time chart. With the red arrow, I've highlighted a point in time where the two partitions in West US2 have substantially different P99 latency than the other two partitions. This in particular is not necessarily a problem, but I highlighted this to show how useful this plot would be if you did need to find partition and region specific behavior occurring during a short time period such as what is shown here. In large cloud deployments where the architect wants to keep a high throughput of transactions flowing through the system, low operations per minute or OPM can become a signal that something is wrong. Similar to what we discussed before, you can bin recent request data by the minute and simply plot the count of records in each bin as a time chart as shown and correlate any changes in performance with other events happening in the system. Now this time, I'll actually walk through constructing the log analytics query. You would enter this query in the portal and see the results in the portal as well. So, this clause selects only for the last hour of data. This clause selects that we only want statistics on create, aka insert, operations. And this clause selects the data plane request category, which is appropriate if we want to select for insert operations because data plane requests has a column for uh, operation type. And in case you have multiple containers in your account, this clause filters for records on just a single container. In this case, the collection RID is a unique identifier of the container. Now here's the meat of the query. We bin the time generated timestamp and summarize each bin by the record count during that minute. And finally, the last line renders a time chart. Some other really useful queries I leverage all the time include generating a time chart of throttling, i.e. 429 errors per minute, generating a time chart of percentile payload size per minute, and generating a time chart of cross-region calls per minute. Cross-region calls especially are a common issue in globally distributed databases where, uh, excuse me, globally distributed database deployments, uh, where one region fails either in the database or in the uh, client application, uh, but in a quiet way, causing the client application to fail over and send requests to another region so that that second region starts to throttle from overload. Now, in this situation, you might see the throttling and you might use the 429 time chart query, uh, number one on this list, and think you have a throttling problem. But when you run the third query on this list and you query on calls where the source and the destination region don't match, you realize the actual problem is cross-region calls caused by a quiet failure in another region, which really illustrates the value of log analytics for this kind of live site monitoring and debug. All right, I want to end today's discussion with an overview of Azure Cosmos DB security. Now, there's way more in this area than I could cover today, uh, but 
I'm going to give you the most comprehensive over, over, overview that I can. So stepping back a moment, Azure Cloud is an excellent base for Azure Cosmos DB in terms of security capabilities, having earned a reputation as the world's most trusted cloud. Beyond simply earning cert certifications, Azure arranges for third-party security audits to ensure strong and continued compliance. Azure Cosmos DB has default security mechanisms that are very high already, and you cannot disable that. So we are secure by default with very high standards by default. There is no Cosmos equivalent of setting up a NoSQL database and having the default be no password. We're not that kind of database. There's no way to use us in an insecure way. Whether or not you choose to bring your own security, you always get the benefit of several outer layers of security. Azure Cosmos DB, Azure, and Microsoft's Cyber Defense Team. So all of that said, I want to introduce three security areas where you can protect your applications and data when using Azure Cosmos DB. Network, access control, and data encryption. Network security protects the data in transit. Now, by default, you cannot disable HTTPS for interacting with Azure Cosmos DB APIs. Uh, TLS 1.2 with standard HTTPS verbs and semantics is enforced by default. In fact, this is really a security best practice being rolled out across all cloud providers. New Azure Cosmos DB accounts can only use TTL, uh, or sorry, new Azure Cosmos DB accounts can only use TLS 1.2 or higher. Uh, 1.0 or 1.1 will be rejected. Additionally, all requests are now logged and can be audited after the fact in Azure Monitoring to search for signs of suspicious activity. And as an additional check, the Azure metrics uh, we discussed earlier uh, can, uh, for detecting 429 errors can also be used to detect HTTPS 403 error forbidden errors, giving you an at-a-glance indication if there has been a spike in forbidden attempts. With the IP firewall, Azure also makes it possible to support setting allow or deny rules on IP addresses and ranges of IP addresses to prevent unwanted access. Additional network security comes from two different forms of Azure VNet support in Azure Cosmos DB. If you want there to be limited access to your Azure Cosmos DB account, but you still want Azure Cosmos DB to be able to access outside IP addresses, you can set up a service endpoint by putting your Azure Cosmos DB account inside of a VNet and giving the endpoint a public IP address. With a service endpoint, access to your Azure Cosmos DB account will be restricted to inside the VNet. For even greater security, you can set up a private endpoint or private link in which there is no access into or out of the VNet and your Azure Cosmos DB account has a private IP address. This is the most secure option. Speaking about access control, there are two sets of APIs in Azure for accessing resources. Control plane APIs have nothing to do with data. They're solely for account or resource CRUD. So for example, creating a database or deleting an Azure Cosmos DB account, uh, these are control plane API operations. Azure Cosmos DB control plane API already supports Azure Active Directory for access control, and AAD is a superior option when it's available. Azure also has data plane APIs, and these are what are actually handling the data, operations like read, write, delete, etc. It's what the familiar Azure Cosmos DB SDKs interact with. The trend right now is that while AAD is already standard in the control plane, data plane still relies on master keys or resource tokens for authorization, although this is expected to change as we phase into using AAD for data access. In the meantime, considering the two options currently available, master key is the lowest granularity option. Basically, it is the default Azure Cosmos DB access method with only read or write access control and no other concept of roles. Resource tokens are Azure Cosmos DB specific permission tokens that provide a little more granularity on usage scenarios and have very limited concept of roles. They expire, but they cannot be revoked. Due to eventual expiration, resource tokens have to be refreshed, unlike master key. This requires a separate token broker application, uh, which has permissions to request a token and the ability to exchange a token with the client. You can see how resource tokens cover some important situations, like cases with well-defined permissions around certain use cases, but nonetheless have pains associated due to the need for resource token. Perhaps um, the greatest is that resource token is not associated with any kind of global identity like Azure Active Directory is. Everything about resource tokens is Azure Cosmos DB specific. 
So soon, uh, we will be rolling out AAD support for data access, and this will be uh, replacing, uh, though not uh, uh, entirely getting rid of, uh, resource tokens. At that point, there will be one consistent system for control and data plane access, namely AAD. And in the workings of AAD, no token broker is needed to refresh your application with the latest resource token. This is all handled or made unnecessary by the implementation of AAD. Finally, now that we've explored access control, let's understand how the data itself is actually protected. As we discussed earlier, Azure Cosmos DB is secure by default with, uh, uh, with, a with AES-256 encryption standard throughout the service on all data and impossible to turn off. So all data in Azure Cosmos DB is, as we say, encrypted at rest with a service managed key or SMK. However, that does not stop you from adding your own layer on top using Customer Managed Key or CMK. For those who need two layers of encryption, Customer Managed Key wraps rather than replaces Azure Cosmos DB's default Service Managed Key. At time of writing, client-side encryption is in alpha but will become available soon. This would enable encryption before transit with a special key controlled entirely by the developer. Combined with CMK and SMK, you could, if desired, implement three levels of encryption. So that about wraps up security. Thanks to everyone who joined today. We talked about Azure Cosmos DB as a globally distributed non-relational database with competitive SLAs and many users already in industry. We showed how Azure Cosmos DB scales out and how being a managed service, Azure Cosmos DB is actually really easy to scale because you don't need to manage servers or orchestrate scale out yourself. And finally, we talked about a few best practices and tools to help you monitor, debug, and secure your deployment. Microsoft gladly supports data platform geeks and SQL Server geeks community initiatives. And thanks a lot for your effort in setting up this event. Thanks again to everyone who joined. And don't forget the three ways to win prizes. Post your selfie with the tag DPS2020, give session and conference feedback, and visit our sponsors and exhibitors. Don't forget to follow on social media too. That's where I'll leave you guys. Have a great day.